Okay. Oh. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay Brackman. I am a Python developer up in Chicago. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about multi methods and how to implement them in Python. Um, so right off the bat, I want to be honest, I haven't given a talk in a few years now. I think the last time was actually at Pi Ohio, um, so it's good to be back. Hey, everybody. Um, so I think the, you know, part of the reason for me not giving a talk in a while is I kind of always knew that this was going to be the next thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, it just always kind of interests me, but the sort of, you know, question that would, like, keep me up at night um, for hours uh, was our multi-methods even really Pythonic? Um, and that's kind of a deal breaker question when you want to give a talk about Python at a Python conference. Like, I don't want to tell you like, hey, look at this really cool thing. Never use it, it's terrible. Um, so if you're like me and you're a believer in the Zen of Python, and I mean, hopefully we're all believers in the Zen of Python. If anyone here hates it, like, I guess that's fine or whatever, but like you should be. Um, <laughs> did I hear someone boo? Um, then you know that there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do something. So are multi-methods obvious? And I kind of wrestled with this for a bit until you know I really started to dive into the code that I think uh, multi-methods can help us improve. So in that way, I think this implementation can be an obvious and Pythonic solution to a problem. Uh, also, back in 2005, a little someone named Guido Van Rossum, creator of the language, wrote a blog post about how to implement multi-methods in Python. So with his blessing, I think I'm just going to go on with my talk. Um, so here's a breakdown of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, first, I'll go over you know, what multi-methods are, what they're not. Um, also talk about the anti-patterns that I think multi-methods multi can help us avoid in our code. I'm also going to say multi-methods about 3,000 more times, so I'm sure I'm going to trip that up a little bit more. Um, and then we will look at some actual concrete examples of multi-method implementation. So. What are multi-methods? Um, some of these terms you may have heard in the past. Um, I would hope in, within the last five minutes you've heard multi-methods before. Uh, if you haven't, like, hi, welcome to my talk. Um, so uh, some of these, I, at least in my experience, I've seen used interchangeably. Um, sometimes that's correct. Sometimes it's not always technically correct. Uh, so I'll kind of explain that as we go through these definitions. So let's start out with multi-methods. Um, they are a feature in some programming languages in which function or uh, in which a function or method can be dynamically dispatched based on the runtime type of more than one of its arguments. So just a quick example of that. Let's say we have an add method that takes in um, two integers, adds them together, and returns the result. Let's say we also have another add method that's responsible for taking in two strings, concatenating them, and returning the result. So in our code, if we are calling that add method onto integers, at runtime, we'll be able to determine the type of those parameters are integers, and the call is going to be dispatched to the first add method. Now, if our code calls the add method onto strings at runtime, same thing is going to happen. We'll determine the type of those parameters and dispatch the call to the second method. So the keyword there is multiple dispatch, or I'm sorry, the keyword there is dispatch because if you haven't guessed it yet, multiple dispatch and multi-methods are sort of describing the same thing. Um, now if you come from maybe more of like a Java background, this might sound a little bit similar to overloading. Um, so this is the term where, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'll see people use dynamic overloading or just use overloading when they mean multiple dispatch. Um, so let's, let's take a peek at overloading. So overloading is the ability to create multiple methods of the same name with different implementations. So that sounds familiar. The overloaded function must differ either by arity, so that's to say the number of parameters, or um, the data types of those parameters. Method overloading is usually associated with statically typed programming languages that enforce type checking in function calls. And the determination of which of the methods are used is resolved at compile time. So that's really the big difference um, between overloading and uh, the multiple dispatch that we're going to be looking at in Python. 
Um, Python does not have the concept of compile time static type checking. Um, all of that type checking is going to happen at runtime. Um, so for the sake of consistency in this talk, I'm going to reserve overloading um, for you know this case when we're talking about statically typed programming languages like Java. Um, and multi-methods and multiple dispatch is what I'm going to use to describe the implementations that we will learn about going forward. Um, also on the list, single dispatch. Uh, oh, my little, my little emoji isn't quite right, but that's okay. Um, so single dispatch is very similar to multiple dispatch. Um, the only real difference being that um, the the method calls are dispatched based on only a single argument and not multiple arguments. Um, there was a decorator added to Python 3.4 with PEP443 that adds a uh, single dispatch, it's a single dispatch decorator that was added to the Punk Tools library. So without really going like into this like in super detail, mostly because I'm not even completely comfortable with the subject, um, Python, all methods, all like class methods in Python um, are virtual. So Python already has the concept of dynamic dispatch, and that is to say single dispatch. The decorator that was added in 3.4 gives us the ability to um, create you know, multiple methods of the same name within the same scope. So that implementation is gonna look similar to the multiple dispatch that we'll be implementing um, in a short while. Um, but yeah, this is mostly just here in case people are like, wait, I thought Python already did this sort of thing. Um, it kind of does, but I think multiple dispatch is cooler, so we're just going to talk about that. So, um, to summarize, uh, multi-methods and multiple dispatch are describing the same thing. Um, single dispatch is, you know, quote unquote, a subset of multiple dispatch. Um, Python does support single dispatch. And overloading is just that Java thing that we're not going to talk about anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, let's get into anti-patterns. Uh, uh, when I was practicing this talk with someone that's sitting in the audience right now, um, he told me that my slides needed more pictures. So here. Um, <laughs> so multi-methods, I think, are interesting in their own right. But what makes them at least for me, hopefully for you, a little bit more interesting is having an actual concrete problem set that they can help us solve. So I want to take you through a couple anti-patterns that you may have seen in your own code. Um, like I know I've written these before and now I guess after this talk I have to go home and like rip some stuff out and rewrite it um, so as not to be a hypocrite. But let's, let's dive into these. The first is the giant if, elif, else block of is instance checks. Um, so the class that I have up here um, is a weakly typed adder class. Um, I'll explain my thought process behind this. Python's a strongly typed language, so you know if you try to add a string and an integer together, you'll get an exception uh, because Python doesn't do a lot of that cool, implicit, sometimes terrifying typecasting that a weakly typed language like JavaScript might do. And does like, does anyone ever open like the Dev Console in their browser and just like add types together in JavaScript just to see what happens? Okay, like I'm not the only one that just does that for fun. Sometimes you switch the order of the types and then like different things happen and it's like, whoa! Um, so if you're like, oh my god, I wish Python could do that too, you <laughs> might use the weekly type adder class. Um, so in this class, we have a single static add method that takes in two parameters of unknown type. Um, as we move through the code, it's going to check the types of those parameters before deciding what to do with them. Um, so in the first case, you know, we're checking to see if both are integers, then we'll return the result after adding the integers together. Um, next, we'll check to see if they're strings, concatenate the strings, return the result, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this isn't too bad right here, um, but it has the capacity to get much hairier. Um, and that's kind of what scares me and makes me hate this code a lot. Um, as you want to add support for more and more um, object types, uh, you're going to have to tack on more and more elif, elif, elif statements. And as you start nesting if else's underneath outer if else's, you're going to find yourself with this like giant mass of unit tests that are all like effectively testing one function, but all the 50,000 logic branches that you have in that function. Um, so that's, oh no, no, 
Come back to life. Okay. Um, yeah, anti patterns. Um, so it, this also isn't like the most object oriented approach to doing this. Um, so yeah, the, this isn't great. There is an alternative though. So let's take a look at the overly verbose method names solution where we have the same weakly typed adder class. Um, each one of those uh, if checks, uh, each one of the is instance checks has been pulled out into its own like much more granular much more easily testable method. So we have add integers, add strings, and then we have add integer and string, and then I think you'd see where this is going. This is gonna become really gross. I don't like writing sentences in my method names. Um, verbose method names are great in unit tests because you don't actually have to call them anywhere in your code. They should be very descriptive. Um, but when you're just using this class in your own code, like I think calling weakly typed adder dot add integer and string is just a little like, no, I don't like that. Um, also, like I said earlier, Python doesn't really have the capacity to do any of this cool compile time static type checking that Java might do. So there's really nothing protecting you from calling add strings without string parameters. Um, nothing really enforces that in Python. So some might argue, well, we can get around this by combining these two kind of gross things into one giant gross thing. So here we have the weakly typed adder class. Um, we have our nice you know, add method. Um, that's going to be handling all of the is instance checks for us before directing the call to these verbosely named you know, private methods, like quote unquote private methods. Um, and like, why? Why combine these two gross things together to get a bigger gross thing when we can try something different? I mean, I, personally, I think it would be super nice if this class could just define a bunch of add methods. They're all just called add, super easy to call. And you just sort of throw types at it, and it knows what to do with those types. But that doesn't work in Python. Like, you, you can't just do that right off the bat. Um, so to kind of understand why, uh, I like putting PDBs just in code when I import it to kind of step through and pretend I'm the interpreter a little bit. Um, so let's kind of pretend we're going to do that. So here we have uh, this class again. Um, and we're actually going to be calling the add method um, at the end of this code. So if we were the interpreter and this module was being imported, um, we would you know, start at the first line, um, see that we have a class definition, and then we're going to step in and um, uh, we're going to step into this first function definition. So in Python, um, namespaces are primarily um, implemented as Python dictionaries. So each class definition is going to give that class you know, its own personal little namespace. Um, so you've probably seen that if you've used the vars method or um, checked out like the dict attribute on classes. Um, so as you know, we're going, we're stepping through line by line. Um, the first add method that we're going to be adding to the namespace um, is this one at the top. Um, so we'll be mapping the name add to the static method object at that address in memory. Then we're going to step on down to the next um, method definition. We're going to do the same thing. Register the name add to the second static method object at that address in memory. And finally, we are going to register the third add method, uh, or sorry, the name add to the third static method. Oh, sorry, did someone say? Yep. Uh, as written, this, this code will not throw in any error, right? Like, it, it'll, it'll just, it'll, it'll, it'll add right. that, those three different add methods in line, and it won't, it won't, it won't give any errors, right? Correct. The, the class definition, or like the way we define this class right now won't throw any errors. Um, it's the call at the bottom where we actually try to like run the code that will throw errors. But if you were simply importing the class, you would be totally fine. Um, if you were running this directly in the interpreter, that's where you would see a problem. And I'll explain that in a bit. But yes, good question. Um, nothing, you probably wouldn't know that anything weird is going on here if you, you know, didn't have the knowledge of how Python really like handled these namespaces or how it handles, or in this case, does not handle multiple dispatch. Um, so you'd probably just think, okay, my code's doing whatever. Um, so we have uh, all three of these um, methods. Uh, the, the interpreter has hit each one as we're stepping through. Um, so 
what you may see going on here, uh, if you're familiar with how dictionary implementations work, as you update a dictionary with a key that already exists in the dictionary, the value of that key is going to be overridden. So when we actually call add down here, we're not, oh, so sorry, I should probably explain. Um, here I'm actually trying to call it on two integer objects, um, which would hopefully be handled by the first add method in the list. Um, but what's happening is it's using the static method object um, at the address and memory of the final one that was defined. So this is where we're actually going to see an error because the, th the third method that we've defined here tries to cast um, the first operator uh, to a string and then do string concatenation. So that's not going to work when we cast one to a string and then try to add it to the integer two. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And did, did someone say? Sorry, I feel like I'm like hearing voices up here, but it might just be like everyone next door. Um, so yeah, basically at this point, the interpreter has completely forgotten about um, the first two methods that we tried to define, and it only remembers the last one that we defined, uh, which isn't really helpful for our weekly typed adder class. So um, I guess, yeah, you can't do multiple dispatch in Python. My talk is over. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so I mentioned that blog post earlier. Um, I, I have like a lot of like warm, fuzzy nostalgia for this blog post because like at my last job, we actually used it as inspiration to implement this really cool thing. Um, and it was like sort of one of those projects where you feel like you kind of like just dive completely into it and like learn more about the language in a day than you like ever had before and it's kind of like whoa and mind blowing and then like the code never hits production and it's like sitting covered in dust in a repository somewhere and that's really sad but um, before that happened I was really excited about this blog post so I would love to share it with you. So I'm going to quickly walk you through five minute multi methods in Python by Guido Van Rossum, and just keep in mind, this was written in 2005, and I think, uh, what was that, Python 2.4? Um, so yeah, just, just for context. Um, I'm gonna pull just some of the relevant code samples out and try to go through this quickly so I can actually show you like a live implementation of it. Um, so the first code sample that we have is uh, basically Guido reiterating that the if, elif, else blocks of is instance checks is gross and tedious, not very object oriented, and then he goes on to say that multi methods probably aren't very object oriented either, but I'm just not gonna get into that right now. Um, so if we wanted to implement multi methods in Python, this might be a good first pass. So let's say this is our MM module. This module is going to define three things. Um, first is a global registry. Um, it's just going to be a Python dictionary, empty at first. Um, that registry is going to be responsible for mapping um, function names to multi-method objects. And to understand what a multi-method object is, we can look at the multi-method class. So the multi-method class will be responsible for holding on to a type map, which is, <clears throat> sorry, another Python dictionary. And that dictionary is going to be responsible for mapping the types that a function is responsible for handling to that actual function object. There is also a call method that will allow us to make instances of this object callable. So the call method is basically going to take the um, argument types that you know, we're trying to call the instance on. Um, it's going to grab the, the or, sorry, I feel like I'm saying instance too much and it's starting to sound weird in my head. Um, we're basically going to build a tuple of the types of the arguments that are being passed into this multi-method object. And then we're going to check to see if those types are a key in our type map dictionary. If they are, we're going to find the function that that key is mapped to and return the result. If it's not, we'll raise a type error. Um, finally, we have a register method. And that's going to be responsible for actually registering the types that the functions are meant to handle to those function objects. Um, if we try to register um, two functions that are, you know, both have the same name and are both responsible for handling the same parameter types, uh, we'll raise a duplicate registration type error. And 
last thing in this module. Um, sorry if I'm going through this kind of fast. Hopefully, like actually seeing the code running will clear things up a bit if you're a little lost. Um, but the last thing that we have in this module is the multi-method decorator. This is what we're going to use to decorate our functions and actually turn them into multi-methods. Um, so this decorator is basically just going to grab the function name, um, check to see if that name already exists in our global registry. If it doesn't, it's going to create a new multi-method object for us. Um, if it does, it'll just pull out the one that already exists in the registry. And then it's going to call the register method on that object and register those types to that function that we have decorated. Then it will return the multi-method object. So at this point, we're kind of replacing um, our non-uniquely named functions with a single multi-method object. So here you can, like at the bottom, if you can see, there's sort of in a, just the def foo example that's not super helpful um, of functions that are decorated with the multi-method decorator. So the first one will be responsible for taking in integers, um, sorry, two integers, and the second one is responsible for only taking in the single integer. So I think um, a drawback to this, oh, yes. Yep. Oh. oh. We're gonna, no, we're going to talk about that right now. Um, so a problem with this implementation is that it does not support a function being decorated multiple times. Um, I sort of like kind of threw together like what that might look like, even though this isn't technically correct, but hopefully it illustrates the point. Um, basically, what's happening here, um, the decorator closest to the function is going to be executed first. So let's go back to our, um, the actual decorator code. So the function is going to be passed to the decorator. We're going to gra grab the name and handle all of the registry, yada, yada. Very cool. So by the time this is executed the second time for the outermost decorator, um, the function that we're being passed in is no longer that original function. It's the new multi-method object. So that's where we're going to hit some trouble um, trying to access that name to get our registry all sorted out uh, because we've, at this point, lost that metadata about the function. So to get around this, it's OK. Saved the day. Um, well, Guido did. He wrote all of this. So we can add two lines to this decorator. Um, basically, we're going to monkey patch a last reg attribute to the multi-method object uh, the first time it's called, and that's going to store the original function. Um, so then, you know, if we have this decorated multiple times and the decorator code is executed multiple times for the same function, we can just go in and access that same attribute and get the original function, and then we have the function name. So, oh, that's not the end. Um, let's actually take a look at this code. And give me a second while I blow this up. Oops. Do, 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 do. No. All right. Oh, might have to not do this multiple tab life. Um, so here we have, is, is this big enough? Can everyone in the back see this? All right, I will try to scroll as much as I can to respect how far down the screen y'all in the back can see. Um, so here we have the MM uh, module. This is pretty much exactly the way Guido implemented it. I made a few syntax changes just to make it look a little more Python 3, but I tried to stay true to the original implementation because nostalgia. Um, so we have the global registry up top, um, then our multi-method class that's doing, you know, the, all the things that I said it did earlier. We have the call method, so the instances are callable, um, the register method, and then finally our multi-method decorator. Um, and here I have implemented it with the uh, last reg um, attribute. So, Let's take a look at this weekly typed adder again. Um, I have updated this a little bit um, in like respect for being dry. Um, I've combined the simple, you know, just plus operation here. So strings, uh, two string parameters and two integer parameters can be handled by the same method. Um, and then I've also added 
uh, the string and int and int and string case because again we're building you know a tuple from these arguments so order is going to matter when we're checking the global registry for, or sorry not the global registry the type map for those specific types um, and also to you know I guess try to prove that we can do this in a super object oriented way I extended the original weekly typed adder class um, and added this okay I, I don't know why you would do this but I was <laughs> just really needing an example. Um, so here we can add a dict and a string together. Um, and what's that, what that's going to do is just update the dictionary um, with the string as a key. So I don't, maybe JavaScript does it. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, and then we have a method down here that's like totally commented out. And I'm definitely not going to get to that later. Um, so let me pull this tab back over here. Let's fire up the interpreter and just see if we can import this. Yep. I'm like trying to type while also looking at the clock, so this is just going to be a recipe for for disaster. Um, all right, everything imported. Um, if there were problems with this code, we would have gotten um, one of those type error exceptions um, right off the get-go. So the fact that everything imported is that's good. Let's try it out. Um, so we have our weekly typed adder. Let's see if we can add integers together. Cool. Let's add strings together. All right. Um, oh, and I guess we have a string and an integer. Okay, so that's all working. Um, then, okay, yeah, then we have our extended weekly typed adder. So we can do this. Again, I don't know why you would want to, but hey, it's my code demo. <laughs> um, so all right, that's working. So that's super cool. Um, now, if this were truly like, like object-oriented inheritance, the way that we're used to seeing it, um, I wouldn't expect the child, or I'm sorry, the parent class to have access to the child's method um, of adding a dictionary and a string together. Well, that's great. Um, that's one of the problems with this implementation when you try to you know, jam these into classes. So let's also take a look at this mysterious commented out code. Um, so what if we wanted our extended weekly typed adder class to override the implementation of string addition in the parent class? So in this case, maybe we would want to try to cast the um, operators to integers um, before adding them together and you know if we can we would just do the regular string concatenation so let's save that and pop back over here and close this out and try our import again and now we see this duplicate registration type error so what's happening here is the type map um, or I'm sorry the global registry for uh, the global registry that exists in the MM module is already mapping the name add to a multi method object. That multi method object has a type map that already contains um, the tuple of strings mapped to the original add method that we defined in the parent class. So when we try to you know, reassign this add method, or I'm sorry, like re implement this add method um, in the child class, it's going to raise an exception. So that's not great. What can we do about that? Nope. This, uh, da, da, da. No good. There we go. I'll drag this back over here. So I tried to take a stab at, you know, first off, just improving this implementation to see if we could, you know, actually make it work. Because um, I guess. You know, that's what you do when you encounter a bug. You just sort of slam your head against it and keep throwing more code at it until it works. Um, so before, in the original MM method, what did we have? Uh, we were simply grabbing the function name and then adding that to the registry. So what if we tried to oops, use a fully qualified name where 
instead of just taking the function name that exists in the class, um, we're actually going to grab the module and the class name and the function name and then stick that into the global registry. So to see if this works, let's go back to our adder. We'll import the improved decorator. Also, I, I don't know why I'm still trying to make these tabs work. This is, there we go. Let's do that. All right, make sure this is saved. Okay. Now, let's try to import again. All right, that imported. We didn't see any exceptions, so that's good. Um, let's try it out. Add two integers, cool. And what do we got? A string and an integer, all right. Um, the extended weekly typed adder should be able to add two strings that look like integers. Okay, now what happens if we go back to the parent class and add those same two strings that look like integers? It should just concatenate them. And it does. Awesome. <laughs> I was, oh, thank you. Uh, I was gonna say guys, like don't, don't clap quite yet. Um, <laughs> why can't our child class use the parents add method now and just add two integers together? So this is what happens when you just try to like slam more code at a problem. Um, <laughs> to understand this, let's, actually look at the MM improved module. Um, what's going on in our registry? All right, so here is the global registry. Um, so now we can see that the, um, this fully qualified name, the extended weekly type adders add method is mapped to this multi-method object. Um, the parent classes uh, add method is mapped to this multi-method object. All right, so let's take a look at the child class first. Uh, what is that? Type map. All right, so there's the type map for the parent class. Um, you see, like, the string and string and an int um, arguments are all, you know, mapped to these various functions. Now let's check out the child class. Uh, and unfortunately, our child class only has access to the two functions that it defined. Um, so this isn't great. And again, Python just can't handle multiple dispatch. So my talk is over. No, no it's not. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, guys. I like to fool around. Um, <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's take a look at this. OK, hopefully this is big enough. And I'm going to not do tabs here. Um, so I'm, I don't know, I'm one of those people that kind of just likes to figure it out myself and I was like planning on writing this whole like multi-method like package and you know I was gonna put it up on like PyPI and maybe the new PyPI because I saw that talk this morning that was really cool. But Python is an open source language and I probably would have been reinventing the wheel. So when you actually go to PyPI and search uh, either multi-method, multiple dispatch, or overloading, there are so many packages that you can install that can kind of help you with this issue. Um, so I did a little bit of experimentation with, um, I don't know how many I tried out um, before settling on this one that I liked the most. Um, but again, feel free to you know kind of check out the ones that um, I won't be demonstrating here today. So there's like PolyPy. I think there's some called um, like some that are just called multi-method. Um, a few that are just called overloading. So again, like interchangeably using that word like isn't my favorite. But don't sell yourself short by not searching for PI or searching for overloading on PyPI just to see how other people are trying to implement solutions to this problem. Um, but the one I liked the most was Multiple Dispatch 2. And Multiple Dispatch 2 is just a fork of Multiple Dispatch. 
Um, what was added in this fork was support for the type annotation syntax, which I think can look super cool. Um, if you're not familiar with the type annotation syntax, um, I got really excited when I learned about this. So I was like, oh, like static type checking and, and Python, like this is awesome. Like it's really just like static type analysis, so you can like sort of run that over your code um, before you like even hit the interpreter and it can you know, point out problems. Um, it's, it's not actually any sort of magic that's happening when you're running your code. Um, but still, the syntax is really cool um, and I think it can make your code a lot more readable so you sort of know what to expect um, in your various functions. The way that I'm using multiple, or sorry, multiple dispatch to um, with the functions that are decorated multiple times uh, doesn't really support that syntax so I can't show it off here. But definitely check out um, GitHub because uh, they do demo that and like in their readme and I think it looks pretty slick. So um, let's walk through this. In multiple dispatch 2, you can import this really cool method dispatcher class. And basically, we are going to be creating our own new ad decorator um, by instantiating this method dispatcher. And it's kind of going to do a similar thing um, as to what our code was doing before. We won't be maintaining a global registry um, like with this implementation, but we will have all of our various types mapped to the actual function objects that are meant to handle those types. So. Here we have, again, this weekly typed adder class. Um, instead of the multi-method decorator, I'm using this you know, add instance with the uh, register method, and that's what's going to take in the object types. Um, notice my function names have disappeared, and now they are just little underscores. But that's okay, because we can still call add um, the same way we were previously. And here we have the extended weekly typed adder class, um, inheriting from the weekly typed adder. Uh, the thing here is, I'm, I'm gonna say like this still looks a little more object oriented than what we saw before. Whatever, it's my code demo. <laughs> um, so here I am taking a deep copy of um, the uh, method dispatcher from the parent class um, because we don't want to just get an alias of that same dispatcher and then override it which is what we were seeing in the first demo where the parent class then had access to the child class's methods. Um, so this is sort of a way around that. Um, the <clears throat> Uh, again, the function names have disappeared and they are now replaced by underscores, but it's okay. We can still call add. And the extended weekly typed adder is doing the same thing. It has this weird dict string addition and also the overridden string string addition. All right, so let's demo. Uh, yep, there we go. Oh, that did work. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Call the adder again. All right, everything imported, so we're good. Now, can we add integers? We can. Can we add integers that, or strings that look like integers and just concatenate them? Okay, we can. That's good. Thank you. Um, can we add dictionaries and strings? We can't, which is good because this is the parent class and it doesn't have, it shouldn't have any knowledge of that method. Um, and I think this, you know, this is pretty, oh, actually I should probably scroll down a bit so you in the back can see it. Um, can it find a signature for add that takes an addicted string? So that's very helpful. Um, all right. Now like fingers crossed for the child class. Can we add integers? We can. Can we add strings that look like integers and get integer addition. Oh my god, we can. And can we do our weird... <laughs> Again, this is like the worst one to sign off on because like, why would you do this? I don't know. Uh, and you can, so cool. So now we have um, two classes that are sort of like doing this inheritance object-oriented thing with multi-methods, but like maybe not really, but it kind of looks okay, so 
hey, we made it work. That's exciting. Um, and yeah, you can do all of this with the uh, multiple dispatch to package. Um, but again, feel free to check out the other implementations because you know people are doing all sorts of cool stuff with multiple dispatch in Python. Um, again, this is just the one I liked best because you can sort of jam it into classes and just make it work. Um, and I'm trying to think if there is anything else. I don't think there is, so let me just pop back over to my slides. Boop, boop, boop. All right, um, so that's all that I have. Um, I am going to put um, the slides and the code samples up on my GitHub tonight. If I don't, you can yell at me on Twitter. Mm. All right, so are there any questions? I think I actually did finish a little bit early, so yeah, yes. I have not, oh yes, okay, so the question is, um, can you use multiple dispatch with an init method and should you? Um, I have not experimented with that, so I cannot definitely say yes or no. I wanna say that's, I, I wanna say that's not gonna work and like no, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, I am curious though as to like, when you think that would be useful. Um, like if, if you want to sure. shout it out or we can talk later. Ah. Yes, yes, I see what you're saying, okay, so I sort of prefer, instead of trying to like do that kind of like constructor thing, sorry, words, um, in those cases I'd almost prefer to have like different just factory methods that can spit out classes um, based on the parameters that you pass in. Uh, maybe in that case, like if it is a factory method that just has the same name, like sure you could use multi-methods for that, but specifically for the init method, I don't really like touching things that have that many underscores, so. <laughs> That's a good rule of thumb. Thank you. Yes. Sometimes um, uh, I've tried to have um, it, it, a function that's, that's getting an input that's, that's a file, right? Mm -hmm. and a file could be you know, a string, which is a file. Yep. It could be a list of strings. That's each line of a file. It could be a string, you know? And uh, I've, I've given myself myself crazy to figure out how to do this the right way, you know, a good way. Um, and there's, there's ABC. Python has ABC. Right? Mm -hmm. so you yes. Can, you can do all of this with ABC. You can, do, you can use the, the numeric abstract base class. You can use the collection of abstract base class to identify a, a, an iterable. So my question is, um, there's no ABC for a file string. There's no ABC for a string. You, the only ABC is an iterable, right? So the, um, there's no, so identifying the, the, a string from a list, um, it, if you want to stick with Python dump typing, okay, mm -hmm. and, and not compare against a string type, right? Like if you, if you want to be able to accept anything that, that, that talks like a string, acts mm -hmm. like a string, um, it, it's, it's often difficult to make, to differentiate between a string and, and another kind of iterable, because you can iterate through both of them. Have you, so my, my question is, have you found a good way to di differentiate um, you know, when you're when you're accepting different kinds of things, to stick with duct typing, not do S, an STR check, mm -hmm. okay? But but like some kind of uh, subclass hook with ABC or, or something oh, like that interesting. to 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 differentiate an iterable and a string because interval's and strings act exactly the same almost mm -hmm. like in every way except for when when you actually try to go to use the string to or, or, you know replace or sub or sub you know substitute something or whatever it is you know, split. So. Make sure I'm I'm saying this right. I think the question is um, when. Can you hmm, help me out here? Um, so the question is, is there a good way to differentiate between 
um, objects that, again, like with Python duct typing. Um, oh, God. I'm having a really terrible time rewording the question that you just asked me, even though it made to be. It, So, well, I guess in this case, like with iterables specifically, I, yeah, so. That's not your fault, that's the world. That's the world. Um, well, yeah, so specifically with what I've shown today, um, this is going to be like instance checking. So the actual type of whatever you're passing in. Um, the original implementation from the blog post is something that um, I've played around with to do multiple dispatch on the values of the parameters and not the types of the parameters. So they would effectively be accepting string methods all the time, but it's the value of those string, or not string methods, string instances all the time. Um, but it's the value of those strings that would determine where the call is dispatched to. So in your case, I don't know if I've done anything like specific to what you're describing. Um, it's hard to solve. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hi. Uh, I have another question. Uh, you said you don't like touching underscores, but I was wondering if uh, you tried this on other Dundra methods. Like, if I wanted to use this on Dundra add, like the an object space add method and then use on multi-method, so that. So you know, I. Now I'm like kicking myself for not doing this on any of the Dunder methods. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much magic is tied into any of those just implicitly. Um, I don't. Hmm. It does work? You can? OK. Well, you can do it. I have not tried to. Oh, sorry. Oh, I do have five. Oh. Oh, OK. I have zero, but like actually five minutes left. Sorry. Um, so uh, if it does work, that is awesome. It's not something that I've experimented with um, personally. I guess I just haven't really found um, the specific use case where I would want to use um, the Dunder methods like with a, with multiple dispatch. Um, but yeah, now this is probably something I'm going to try out um, later. So yeah, thank you for your question. Yes. Oh, just, just whoever, just both of you go at the same. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, if you have coworkers, definitely do not use multiple dispatch. They're all going to hate you. Uh, this is really just a proof of concept, guys. Um, so. I, I, that was actually what I was just gonna say. Like I am, I hate writing doc strings. I hate writing comments. I hate them so much. Uh, your code should just be readable and self-documenting. So if your multi-method names are readable and self-documenting, then your coworkers should be fine and everything will be great. Um, really. <laughs> so I'm not. I'm actually not sure how um, doc strings. Um, well. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I, mm, I'm trying to like work it through in my head right now. And then I was like, oh, I should try to like live code it and then we should yeah. like, yeah, that never works. Um, so maybe I can like tweet out to you guys after this, uh, guys and gals after this, um, once I've investigated. But I think primarily, um, at least for me personally, unit tests are my favorite form of documentation. So if you have some great unit tests um, that are testing each of these methods, uh, and your unit tests have those like awesome, super long, verbose names. So when one fails, you know pretty much exactly why it failed. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to find that in the code relatively quickly. Um, but yeah, your coworkers may hate you. That's that's like the asterisk I should have put on this. Well, maybe about it. Anyway, your coworkers probably you know hate you anyway for yeah. something else you did like a year ago, and you yelled at them on that pull request. <laughs> so uh, yes, sorry. Yes, it does. Um, so the method dispatcher that I'm using is, oh, sorry, I'm terrible at repeating questions. Um, does the 
Uh, multiple dispatch to package work with um, module functions as well as class methods? The answer is yes. Um, the method dispatch class is specifically for class methods, um, but actually, you know, I think I might have the GitHub up. Oh, I do. Uh -huh. um, boop. Make this a little bigger. Um, so here is the, if you can see this, here is the much prettier um, dispatch decorator that is also available in this package. And here you can see it in use with the super cool um, type annotation syntax. So yes, this does work for um, module functions as well. Thank you. Yes. Does it work with mocks? Does it work with mocks? Um, does multiple dispatch work with mocks? Um, a uh, mock like oh, like mocked objects. mocked ob oh, yeah, mocked yeah, yeah, objects sure. like so are you asking if you like if you mock a multi method oh now I do oh, okay sorry now I actually do have zero minutes um, oh good because I wasn't sure of the answer everyone leave <laughs> um, uh, actually that's a good question I'm not sure okay thank you thank you. You're like me, and you're a believer in the Zen of Python, and I mean, hopefully we're all believers in the Zen of Python. If anyone here hates it, like, I guess that's fine or whatever, but like, you should be. Um, <laughs> did I hear someone boo? Um, then you know that there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do something. So are multi-methods obvious? And I kind of wrestled with this for a bit until you know, I really started to dive into the code that I think uh, multi-methods can help us improve. So in that way, I think this implementation can be an obvious and Pythonic solution to a problem. Uh, also, back in 2005, a little someone named Guido Van Rossum, creator of the language, wrote a blog post about how to implement multi-methods in Python. So with his blessing, I think I'm just going to go on with my talk. Um, so here's a breakdown of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, first, I'll go over you know, what multi-methods are, what they're not. Um, also talk about the anti-patterns that I think multi Okay. Oh. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay Brackman. I am a Python developer up in Chicago. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking to you about multi-methods and how to implement them in Python. Um, so right off the bat, I want to be honest, I haven't given a talk in a few years now. I think the last time was actually at Pi Ohio, um, so it's good to be back. Hey, everybody. Um, so I think the, you know, part of the reason for me not giving a talk in a while is I kind of always knew that this was going to be the next thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, it just always kind of interests me. But the sort of, you know, question that would, like, keep me up at night um, for hours uh, was, are multi-methods even really Pythonic? Um, and that's kind of a deal breaker question when you want to give a talk about Python at a Python conference. Like, I don't want to tell you, like, hey, look at this really cool thing. Never use it. It's terrible. Um, so if, let's take a peek at overloading. So overloading is the ability to create multiple methods of the same name with different implementations. So that sounds familiar. The overloaded function must differ either by arity, so that's to say the number of parameters, or um, the data types of those parameters. Method overloading is usually associated with statically typed programming languages that enforce type checking in function calls, and the determination of which of the methods are used is resolved at compile time. So that's really the big difference um, between overloading and uh, the multiple dispatch that we're going to be looking at in Python. Um, Python does not have the concept of compile time static type checking. Um, all of that type checking is going to happen at runtime. Um, so for the sake of consistency in this talk, I'm going to reserve overloading um, for you know, this case when we're talking about statically type programming languages like Java. Um, and multi-methods and multiple dispatch is what I'm going to use to describe the implementations that we um, two integers, adds them together, and returns the result. Let's say we also have another add method that's responsible for taking in two strings, concatenating them, and returning the result. So in our code, if we are calling that add method on two integers, at runtime, we'll be able to determine the type of those parameters are integers, and the call is going to be dispatched to the first add method. 
Now, if our code calls the add method on two strings at runtime, same thing is going to happen. We'll determine the type of those parameters and dispatch the call to the second method. So the keyword there is multiple dispatch, or I'm sorry, the keyword there is dispatch because if you haven't guessed it yet, multiple dispatch and multi methods are sort of describing the same thing. Um, now, if you come from maybe more of like a Java background, this might sound a little bit similar to overloading. Um, so this is the term where you know sometimes sometimes I'll see people use dynamic overloading or just use overloading when they mean multiple dispatch. Um, so let's multi methods can help us avoid in our code. I'm also going to say multi methods about three thousand more times, so I'm sure I'm going to trip that up a little bit more. Um, and then we will look at some actual concrete examples of multi method implementation. So. What are multi-methods? Um, some of these terms you may have heard in the past. Um, I would hope in, within the last five minutes you've heard multi-methods before. Uh, if you haven't, like, hi, welcome to my talk. Um, so uh, some of these, I, at least in my experience, I've seen used interchangeably. Um, sometimes that's correct. Sometimes it's not always technically correct. Uh, so I'll kind of explain that as we go through these definitions. So let's start out with multi-methods. Um, they are a feature in some programming languages in which function or uh, in which a function or method can be dynamically dispatched based on the runtime type of more than one of its arguments. So just a quick example of that, let's say we have an add method that takes in 